Section 4 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Peace Without Plenty, 1815-1822, to 1822, Part 2. The harvest of 1817 was an exceptionally good one, and in the autumn things quieted down but before the year ended the whole nation was plunged into mourning by the death in childbirth of the princess charlotte november sixth her death not only removed a popular princess but rendered the succession to the crown in the direct line exceedingly precarious of george the third's thirteen sons and daughters not one had a legitimate child the eldest collateral descendant, William Duke of Gloucester, was also childless. Under these circumstances, the duty of the royal dukes was obvious, and in the following year, 1818, four royal marriages were solemnized. The Duke of Clarence married the Princess Adelaide of Saxe Meiningen, the Duke of Cambridge, the Princess Augusta of Hessel Cassel, the Duke of Kent the Princess Victoria of Saxe Coburg, widow of Charles, Prince of Leiningen, while the Princess Elizabeth married Frederick, Landgrave of Hesse Hamburg. It is significant that despite the great anxiety as to the succession, the House of Commons should have shown itself exceptionally parsimonious in making provision for the royal bridegrooms. A modest grant of ten thousand pounds a year proposed for the Duke of Clarence was reduced to six thousand, and in high dudgeon refused by him as totally inadequate. Grants of similar amount were made to the Dukes of Cambridge and Kent in the teeth of strong opposition, while a proposal for an addition of six thousand pounds to the Duke of Cumberland, who had lately married, was actually rejected so low had the prestige and popularity of the crown been brought by the prince regent and his brothers when parliament reassembled on january twenty seventh eighteen eighteen the regent was able to congratulate the country upon a marked improvement in the financial situation a good harvest was followed by a distinct revival in trade and that again by a subsidence of disorder the government was able therefore to dispense with the exceptional powers bestowed upon the executive by the suspension of the habeas corpus act the act of the previous session lapsed on march first and has never since that day been reenacted in england it was deemed necessary however to obtain an act of indemnity for all those who had in virtue of the powers conferred upon them by the suspensory act detained suspects in custody, or had suppressed tumultuous and unlawful assemblies. The Indemnity Act, though a natural sequel of the Suspension Act, and in accordance with precedent, was not passed without fierce debate in both houses. The necessity for such an act is a striking testimony to the way in which the principle of habeas corpus has intertwined itself with the fibres of the English Constitution. It was at this time that Parliament showed its concern for the impaired morals of the people by voting the sum of one million pounds toward the erection of new churches. At the same time, it demonstrated its steadfast adherence to the principles of Wilberforce by granting four hundred thousand pounds to the Spanish government to compensate the Spaniards for their abolition of the slave trade. Having done so much for religion and humanity, Parliament could await its dissolution with serenity. Sir Francis Burdett sought to disturb its closing days by a motion in favour of universal suffrage, annual parliaments, electoral districts, and vote by ballot, but he failed to secure a single vote in its favour. Parliament was dissolved on June 10th. The general election was attended with unusual excitement, over 100 constituencies being contested. The opposition could make but little impression upon the compact Tory majority, but several notable fights ended in their favour. 
Romilly and Burdett were returned after a violent contest for Westminster. In the city, Sir William Curtis, a Tory member who had sat for twenty-eight years, lost his seat, and three Whigs with one Tory were returned. Broom vainly attempted to win Westmoreland from the Lauters, and there were stiff fights in Wilts, Herefordshire, Devonshire, Kent, and Lincolnshire. In all, the Whigs gained about 30 votes. The recent elections plainly show that the people are no longer under the guidance of shallow pretenders to constitutional learning or base dealers in vulgar sedition, and that even the most respectable zealots of reform have failed to estrange them from their natural leaders. Such was the complacent comment of a great Whig organ on the results of the general election of 1818. Notwithstanding these victories in the country, the opposition was very far from being an effective parliamentary force. The Whig party was indeed hopelessly disorganized and divided. In the House of Lords, Lord Grenville held aloof in haughty isolation, in the House of Commons, the front rank had of late been terribly thinned by the hand of death. Whitbread, to the deep regret of all good men, died by his own hand in 1815. George Ponsonby, the titular head of the Whig Party, and Horner in 1817. Sir Samuel Romilly, like Whitbread, by suicide in 1818. Tierney succeeded Ponsonby in the leadership but Burdett and the small group of radicals owed him no allegiance, and even his nominal lieutenants were frequently in revolt. By far the ablest man in the party was Henry Broom, but his restlessness, egotism, tactlessness, and vanity, to say nothing of his unpopularity, rendered him impossible as leader. Tierney, though held up to ridicule by Creevey, was conciliatory and popular, and divided the party less than any other leader who could at the moment have been selected. When the new Parliament met on January 14, 1819, the speech from the throne reported with satisfaction a considerable and progressive improvement of the revenue. The Master of the Mint, Wellesley Pole, wrote in similar strain to his friend Charles Baggett, The revenue flourishes, the reductions are great, the country is quiet, and all the world is at peace. The complacency of the government was short-lived, for the year 1819 was destined to see the Peterloo Massacre and the passing of the Six Acts. But for the moment the talk was all of the currency. Sidney Smith wittily complained that he got nothing now in town but soup and bullion, on February 2nd, Tierney moved for the appointment of a committee on the state of the circulating medium and on the continuance of the Bank Restriction Act. But on the motion of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a secret committee was preferred. Presided over by Robert Peel, and including such men as Van Sittert, Castlereagh, Canning, Tierney, Wellesley Pole, Huskisson, and Sir James Mackintosh, the committee presented its report to the House on April 5th and May 6th. Peel's reputation as a financier dates from his appointment as chairman of this remarkable committee. Born in Lancashire on February 5th, 1788, he was little more than 30 at this time, the eldest son of a man who made an enormous fortune in the Lancashire cotton trade. He belonged by birth to the new aristocracy of commerce. His father, the first Sir Robert, was a first-rate businessman, a stout Tory, an enthusiastic supporter of Pitt and his policy, and a subscriber of £10,000 to the French War Fund, and the author of the first of a long series of factory acts. The elder Peel was convinced that the prosperity of England rested upon three main foundations, the Corn Laws, the Protestant Establishment, and Inconvertible Paper. In this creed, the younger Robert Peel was reared. 
educated at Harrow and Christ Church, he was brought into the House of Commons in 1809 as member for Cashel, an Irish borough, picked up for him by his father, and burdened with only twelve constituents. Attached to the Tory party, he served his official apprenticeship as Under-Secretary for War and the Colonies, under Spencer Percival, and for six years, from 1812 to 1818, was Chief Secretary for Ireland in the Liverpool Ministry. To Canning's chagrin, he was elected as the representative of the University of Oxford in 1817. Footnote. Peel owed his selection to the fact that he opposed, while Canning favoured, Catholic emancipation. End footnote. And in the following year, he resigned the chief secretaryship. His appointment as chairman of the Bullion Committee in 1819 was rightly regarded as an immense compliment to so young a man and marked his admission to the front rank in his party and in the House of Commons. Peel entered upon his task with an open mind. In 1810, he had voted against the proposal for the resumption of cash payments as recommended by Horner's committee, but circumstances had changed. Reference has already been made to the grave inconvenience resulting from the violent fluctuations in prices. The Bank Restriction Act was unquestionably one of the contributory causes of these fluctuations, and Peel's committee reported strongly in favor of the gradual resumption of cash payments. A masterly speech from Peel persuaded the House to a unanimous acceptance of the report. It was resolved that cash payments should be gradually resumed and that from May 1st, 1823, the bank should pay its notes in gold. So strong was the position of the bank that cash payments were in fact resumed two years before the stipulated date on May 1st, 1821 that the resumption inflicted some temporary hardship on individuals is not to be denied, but it is none the less true that few acts, if any, have contributed more powerfully to the stability of English commerce and the maintenance of English credit than the Bullion Act of 1819. This act was the only important legislative achievement of the first session of the new Parliament, but resistance to reform was clearly weakening in the House of Commons. Grattan's motion in favor of Catholic emancipation was rejected in a full house only by a majority of two, while that of Lord Archibald Hamilton, demanding a select committee to investigate the state of Scottish representation, was actually carried. On the other hand, Burdett's attempt to pledge the House to consider the question of parliamentary reform in the ensuing session was heavily defeated. Although the House of Commons declined to take the reform question seriously, the temper of the country was rapidly rising. Political agitation was, as usual, powerfully stimulated by economic distress. The improvement in trade manifested in 1818 was not maintained. Clouds again gathered on the commercial horizon, the number of bankruptcies increased ominously. Wages fell. Complaints of unemployment grew louder, and in the early summer great meetings were held at Glasgow, Ashton-under-Lynn, Leeds, Stockport, and elsewhere. A meeting at Birmingham, held on July 12th and attended by more than 15,000 persons, adopted the novel expedient of electing Sir Charles Wolseley, a Staffordshire baronet as legislatorial attorney and representative of Birmingham. But while the proceedings at Birmingham were tinged with farce, those at Manchester resulted in grim tragedy. On August 16th, a vast meeting took place in St. Peter's Fields, now in the very heart of the great city of Manchester. From all the neighboring districts of Lancashire and Cheshire, the men came in their thousands, many of them in regular marching order five deep, all preceded by flags surmounted with caps of liberty and bearing various mottoes such as no corn laws, annual parliaments, universal suffrage, vote by ballot, 
the number present was roughly computed at eighty thousand hardly had the chairman orator hunt mounted the hustings when the yeomanry with drawn sabres charged into the dense throng to effect his arrest in an instant all was confusion crowds of people were trampled underfoot several were killed a few were sabred to death three or four hundred were more or less severely injured hunt and various associates were arrested and committed for trial by the lancashire magistrates and after various postponements were convicted at york not of high treason as was originally intended but on a charge of conspiracy to alter the legal frame of the government and constitution of these realms by force and threats and with meeting tumultuously at manchester with sixty thousand persons armed with sticks hunt was sentenced to two years and six months imprisonment samuel bamford and two other defendants to a year's imprisonment in each case they were required to find sureties to be of good behaviour during a further term of five years meanwhile congratulations poured in upon the victors of peterloo the local magistrates returned thanks to the commanders officers and men of all the corps who had taken part in the actions of the day particularly expressing their gratification at the extreme forbearance exercised by the yeomanry when insulted and defied by the rioters the regent expressed his high approbation of the exemplary manner in which the yeomanry assisted and supported the civil power and lord sidmouth conveyed the message with great satisfaction in other quarters other views prevailed subscription lists were opened in london and liverpool for the victims of the manchester massacre meetings were held at norwich westminster bristol liverpool nottingham and york some simply asked for inquiry others strongly censured the conduct of the manchester authorities and the ministry the great meeting at york was attended by lord fitzwilliam who was in consequence dismissed from the lord lieutenancy of the west riding still more significant was the action of the common council of london who on september ninth asserted the undoubted right of the englishmen to assemble together for the purpose of deliberating upon public grievances insisted that the manchester meeting was legally assembled and that its proceedings were orderly and peaceable and finally expressed their strongest indignation at the unprovoked and intemperate conduct of the authorities in view of the rising excitement of the nation the ministry took the wise step of summoning parliament in the autumn it met on november twenty third and a week later lord sidmouth outlined the proposals of the government after much debate and formal protests from lord grey and other whig peers but with the entire concurrence of lord grenville and his friends the six acts became law the titles of these acts sufficiently indicate their import they were designed number one to prevent delay in the administration of justice in cases of misdemeanour number two to prevent the training of persons in the use of arms and the practice of military evolutions number three for the prevention and punishment of blasphemous and seditious libels number four to authorize justices of the peace in certain disturbed counties to seize and detain arms number five to subject certain publications to the duties of stamps upon newspapers and to make other regulations for restraining the abuses arising from the publication of blasphemous and seditious libels and number six for more effectually preventing seditious meetings and assemblies much violent criticism has been expended upon these acts and castlereagh in particular has been held up to the execration of posterity for the part which he took in passing them through the house of commons but to three out of six the first second and fourth no serious objection can be taken the third after remaining for some years a dead letter was repealed in eighteen thirty the duration of the act for the prevention of seditious meetings was expressly limited to five years and that for the seizure and detention of arms to a little more than two tierney found in the proposals of the executive 
an evident determination to resort to nothing but force that force is no remedy is a favorite aphorism with orators and opposition that it is no permanent remedy is true but it is equally true that occasions arise when its application is essential to the existence of civilized society whether such an occasion had arisen in eighteen nineteen is a question which the historians of to-day should be slow dogmatically to decide at any rate against the prevailing opinion of contemporaries before parliament reassembled in eighteen twenty the longest reign hitherto recorded in english history had come to an end death had been busy of late in the ranks of the royal family the princess charlotte died in eighteen seventeen the queen in eighteen eighteen the duke of kent on january twenty third eighteen twenty and a week later january twenty ninth the poor old king himself was released from his living tomb his death evoked an outburst of affectionate loyalty from all classes of his subjects for the last ten years indeed george the third had been nothing more than a shade dragging out a melancholy existence at windsor bereft of reason sight and hearing but it was not forgotten that for fifty years he had played a large if not brilliant part upon the political stage and had represented with remarkable fidelity the views not to say the prejudices of the great majority of his subjects no one can pretend that he was a great ruler but he was eminently a good man and his homely virtues and his simple life his dauntless courage and shrewd wit his untiring industry his generosity and kindliness won him general affection and respect little respect or affection was entertained for his successor and whatever remnant of either sentiment survived was dissipated in the first months of the new reign for more than a year after george the fourth's accession the public mind was almost exclusively occupied with the scandalous relations of the king and queen the discussion of the queen's business wrote greville is now become an intolerable nuisance in society no other subject is ever talked of it is an incessant matter of argument or dispute what will be done what ought to be done all people express themselves tired of the subject yet none talk or think of any other for the moment however attention was diverted from the king to his ministers on february twenty third the country was startled by the news of the conspiracy to which for bloodthirsty folly there had been no parallel since the days of guy fox arthur thistlewood and a band of fanatical associates had planned to get rid of the whole of the detested tory cabinet at one murderous stroke a cabinet dinner to be held at lord harrowby's house in grosvenor square on february twenty third was the occasion selected for the execution of a plot which had been long maturing the government were in possession of complete information through one of their spies named edwards the ministers instead of dining with lord harrowby remained at fife house while the conspirators twenty or thirty in number were surprised in the midst of their preparations at cato street edgware road they offered armed resistance and slew the first constable who entered the stable where they were assembled the police arrangements had been bungled and only nine arrests were made the leader and fourteen associates escaped but thistlewood and several others were captured next morning brought to trial in april on a charge of high treason all the prisoners were convicted and sentenced to death thistlewood and four of his accomplices were executed on may first the other six were respited and transported for life as to the guilt of the prisoners there was and is no question the extent of the conspiracy is more difficult to determine greville declares that the plan was to fire a rocket from lord harrowby's house after the destruction of the cabinet as a signal for a general rising that the bank was to be attacked and the jails thrown open whether any such signal would have been obeyed is doubtful 
the natural alarm excited by the cato street conspiracy was intensified in april by an insurrectionary movement in glasgow and the neighbouring districts the organisers called upon the people of england scotland and ireland to come forward and effect a revolution by force the force however was lacking and the insurrections which took place at bonnymuir and elsewhere were suppressed without difficulty the period of lawlessness and disorder ushered in by the peace of eighteen fifteen culminated in the cato street conspiracy the few remaining years of that tory ascendancy which had now lasted for more than half a century were comparatively tranquil for this there were several reasons the worst of the economic crisis was over and trade abnormally stimulated by the war was gradually restored to a more healthy condition the reconstruction of the liverpool ministry in eighteen twenty two and the infusion of a more liberal element into the cabinet gave hope of reasonable and moderate reform some credit also must be given though it is unfashionable to do so to the firmness with which the principles of law and order had been vindicated by sidmouth and castlereagh it was of course the business of the opposition to oppose in public but in private even opponents admitted the success of their policy everybody agrees wrote a strong whig that the doctor has done his part well nor must it be forgotten that in the early years of the new reign the public mind was diverted first by a court scandal of exceptional magnitude and later by absorbing questions of foreign policy before we can discuss the latter a word must be said of the former if the perspective of history were determined by contemporaries it would be necessary to devote a whole chapter to the queen's business but large as this business looms in the memoirs and diaries of the day the modern historian may compress the sordid and unsavoury details into a paragraph when the prince of wales in seventeen ninety five married the princess caroline of brunswick a bad man was mated to a frivolous foolish and unattractive woman the marital connection hardly survived the formal marriage and even before the birth of the princess charlotte husband and wife had ceased to live together in eighteen o six the whig ministry humoured their patron by appointing a secret committee to conduct a delicate investigation as to the behaviour of the princess but nothing worse than levity was proved against her and in eighteen fourteen she withdrew to italy exasperated by her exclusion from foreign courts and by the omission of her name from the english liturgy she returned to england in june eighteen twenty to claim her rights as queen to annoy the king and embarrass the ministry ever since the death of princess charlotte her father had been increasingly anxious for a divorce and spies had been employed to obtain the necessary evidence on his accession to the throne the king pressed the ministers to institute proceedings but anxious to avoid the inevitable scandal lord liverpool resisted the king's wishes though he promised to meet them should the queen return to england the time for the fulfilment of his promise had now come received by the populace with indiscriminate enthusiasm the queen posed as a distressed and persecuted woman her most valuable asset was in reality the shameless life and political unpopularity of her husband the whigs also were quick to perceive the opportunity of snatching a party advantage from the embarrassments of the government some of the opposition wrote a tory lady are behaving shamefully not only the mob wrote the whig littleton don't be deceived by what your tory friends tell you to the contrary but people of all ranks and the middle classes almost to a man and i believe the troops too side with the queen it was true on june sixth the king insisted that the house of lords should institute an inquiry into his wife's conduct efforts at compromise conducted on the king's part by wellington and castlereagh on the queen's by broom her attorney and denman her solicitor general broke down on two points the question of reception at foreign courts and on that of inclusion in the liturgy the lord's committee reported that the evidence demanded a solemn inquiry 
and on july eighth lord liverpool introduced a bill of pains and penalties to deprive the queen of her title and dissolve her marriage the bill came on for second reading on august seventeenth and the queen's trial for such in effect it was was protracted through the autumn an immense volume of conflicting evidence was taken broom conducted the defence with consummate skill the second reading was carried by a majority of twenty-eight on november sixth the third reading only by nine liverpool accepted the division as a sign of defeat and amid delirious manifestations of popular enthusiasm the bill was dropped i have never met any one of any kind who believes her to be innocent wrote crocker to peel crocker moved in tory circles but he probably reflected the privately expressed opinions of those best qualified to judge even the queen's friends were by this time disposed to recite the prayer of the famous epigram gracious queen we thee implore go away and sin no more should that effort be too great go away at any rate in the following session eighteen twenty one the house of commons voted her an annuity of fifty thousand pounds but she did not live to enjoy it on the refusal of the privy council to allow her to be crowned with the king she foolishly attempted to force her way into the abbey july nineteenth eighteen twenty one a few weeks later her unhappy life came to an end august seventh she had already outlived her transient popularity and the tide was turning in the king's favour his coronation in july was not only celebrated with extravagant magnificence but appeared to evoke some popular enthusiasm in august he paid a visit to ireland where he exerted to such good effect his undoubted powers of fascination that lord dudley declared that if he had stood for dublin he might have turned out shaw or grattan scarcely less enthusiastic though less tumultuous was his reception in scotland a year later in london he was never seen in public during the last seven years of his life he feared the ridicule which might be excited by his dropsical bulk and spent most of his time with lady coningham at brighton a shameless voluptuary to the end lord liverpool's ministry was severely though perhaps undeservedly shaken by the queen's business there were moreover indications that the period of repression was passing away and that parliament was prepared to resume the work of constructive legislation interrupted by the outbreak of the french revolution canning left the cabinet in january of eighteen twenty one in consequence of his inability to concur in the policy of the government toward the queen he was thus free to give his powerful support to plunkett's catholic emancipation bill which was carried through the commons in eighteen twenty one only to suffer extinction in the house of lords a similar fate befell canning's own bill in eighteen twenty two designed to permit roman catholic peers to sit and vote in the house of lords while canning and plunkett were thus active on behalf of the roman catholics lord john russell was pressing forward the cause of parliamentary reform in eighteen twenty his bill for withholding writs from grampound penryn camelford and barnstable passed the commons his resolution in favour of reform was supported by a large minority in eighteen twenty one and in the same session his bill for the disfranchisement of grampound was actually carried though the peers insisted on giving the seats to the county of york instead of the borough of leeds in eighteen twenty two sir james mackintosh succeeded in pledging the house of commons to a reform of the criminal law these things were indicative of the rising tide of opinion both at westminster and in the country at large not less suggestive were the changes in the ministry itself in eighteen twenty two lord sidmouth who had stolidly and courageously borne the brunt of his colleagues unpopularity was succeeded at the home office by peel lord wellesley accepted the lord lieutenancy of ireland plunkett the strenuous advocate of catholic claims became attorney-general and c w wynn succeeded bragg bathurst at the board of control in eighteen twenty three the ministry was further strengthened 
especially on the financial side by the substitution of f j robinson for van sittert at the exchequer and by huskisson's appointment to the board of trade but most important and most significant of all was the change at the foreign office and in the leadership of the house of commons in eighteen twenty two castlereagh who in eighteen twenty one had by his father's death become marquis of londonderry died by his own hand lord liverpool promptly offered both the vacant offices to canning the latter had recently been persuaded to accept the governor-generalship of india and was just on the point of leaving england to assume his new duties he decided however to accept lord liverpool's offer and for the next five years canning was the real ruler of england and all but dictator of europe End of section four Section 5 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3 England and Europe, The Holy Alliance, Castlereagh and Canning, 1815 to 1830, Part 1 the persistent legend that english foreign policy underwent a violent deviation in eighteen twenty two is no longer accepted by competent historians but it is none the less true that the accession of canning to the foreign office was an event of real significance alike for england and for europe in order to gauge adequately its importance it will be necessary to survey the course of english foreign policy since the conclusion of the war at no period in her history have the relations of great britain with the continental powers been so intimate as during the decade which followed waterloo such intimacy was not merely natural but inevitable england it was who had formed and financed successive coalitions against napoleon bonaparte who thanks to castlereagh had prevented at chatillon the disruption of the last coalition on the eve of final victory who thanks to wellington had secured at waterloo the ultimate overthrow of the common enemy her minister was largely responsible for the terms of the settlement of eighteen fifteen and her general commanded the joint army of occupation which guaranteed their execution that england should intervene more closely and more continuously than usual in the concerns of continental europe is therefore a matter neither for surprise nor reproach nor is it wonderful that the allied sovereigns and their ministers should have welcomed this opportunity to put international relations on a more satisfactory basis in this laudable ambition the holy alliance had its genesis few diplomatic efforts have incurred more odium or more ridicule and neither is wholly deserved its author the czar alexander of russia was a curious mixture of shrewdness and mysticism of lofty ideals and calculating ambition in its origin the holy alliance was a genuine attempt to apply the principles of christian ethics to international politics to revive the idea of a confederacy of nations and to rebuild the european polity upon a religious basis according to the terms of the original scheme announced by the czar in september eighteen fifteen the sovereigns of russia austria and prussia bound themselves agreeably to the words of holy scripture which commands all men to love as brothers to remain united in the bonds of true and indissoluble brotherly love always to assist one another to govern their subjects as parents to maintain religion peace and justice they consider themselves but as members of one and the same christian family commissioned by providence to govern the branches of one family 
they call on all powers who acknowledge similar principles to join this holy alliance the regent of england not being a sovereign was technically ineligible for membership in the alliance but he wrote to his brothers to express his cordial assent to the sublime principles enunciated by the czar the sovereigns of france spain and the two sicilies subsequently gave in their adherence metternich regarded the whole transaction with cynical contempt castlereagh to whom enthusiasm of any kind was unintelligible described it as a piece of mysticism and nonsense and was led to doubt the sanity of the czar canning was more suspicious as to his sincerity corruptio optimi pessima representing in its original conception a noble if impractical ideal the holy alliance so rapidly degenerated as to justify the worst suspicions of canning in its practical working after eighteen eighteen it came to mean an attempt to direct the internal affairs of the several states by means of periodical conferences in the interests of autocracy and reaction in the holy alliance itself england as we have seen had no formal part but closely connected though not to be confounded with it was the quadruple treaty concluded on november twentieth eighteen fifteen between great britain austria prussia and russia specifically based upon the treaties of chaumont march first eighteen fourteen and vienna march twenty fifth eighteen fifteen this quadruple alliance was primarily the work of castlereagh the high contracting parties wishing to employ all their means to prevent the general tranquillity the object of the wishes of mankind and the constant end of their efforts from being again disturbed desirous moreover to draw closer the ties which unite them for the common interests of their people solemnly renewed their adherence to the treaties of chaumont and vienna mutually guaranteed the second treaty of paris and finally in order to facilitate and to secure the execution of the present treaty and to consolidate the connections which at the present moment so closely unite the four sovereigns for the happiness of the world agreed to renew their meetings at fixed periods for the purpose of consulting upon their common interests and for the consideration of the measures which at each of these periods shall be considered the most salutary for the repose and prosperity of nations and for the maintenance of the peace of europe such were the principal stipulations of the famous document which laid the foundation of the concert of europe and continued to exercise a great though diminishing influence upon international relations for the next thirty years with the principle of concert it is difficult to quarrel yet unless it were carefully worked and vigilantly watched danger lurked in the scheme that castlereagh was not blind to the danger is clear from the warning which he addressed to the foreign missions before the close of the year in the present state of europe it is the province of great britain to turn the confidence she has inspired to the account of peace by exercising a conciliatory influence between the powers rather than put herself at the head of any combinations of courts to keep others in check these words suffice not merely to define the policy of great britain but also to acquit castlereagh of the charge uncritically reiterated of having tied england to the tail of the holy alliance canning's appreciation of the danger lurking in government by congresses may have been more acute than castlereagh's and his language was certainly more emphatic but canning was not foreign secretary and castlereagh was to have broken up the european concert attained by infinite pains and not yet convicted of reactionary tendencies would have been on the part of the responsible minister an act of unpardonable levity castlereagh's policy was a combination of cooperation and vigilance and few can now doubt that it was statesmanlike and sound three years passed 
and the quadruple allies found themselves in conference at Aix-la-Chapelle, September through November, 1818. The sovereigns of Russia, Austria, and Prussia were present in person. Among the accredited diplomatists were Castlereagh and Wellington, Metternich from Austria, Hardenberg and Bernstorff from Prussia, Nesselroda and Capodistria from Russia. The Duke of Richelieu, Prime Minister of France, was also admitted to plead for the evacuation of France by the Allied troops. The consideration of this question was indeed the primary purpose of the Congress. The Treaty of Paris had provided that the military occupation of France might cease at the end of three years if the Allies approved. The decision really rested with the Duke of Wellington, and the Duke advised that the army of occupation might, without danger to France herself and to the peace of Europe, be withdrawn. The Congress accepted his advice. France, backed by the great financial houses of Bering and Hope, entered into renewed engagements for the payment of the unliquidated claims of the Allies, and by the end of the year not a single foreign soldier was encamped upon the soil of France. At the same time, France was formally readmitted to the polite society of Europe, and thus the Quadruple Alliance of 1815 was converted into the Moral Pentarchy of 1818. Not, however, in its original form. Three years had sufficed to confirm the suspicions of the English cabinet. The spirit of reaction had already manifested itself not obscurely in France and Germany, still more violently to the south of the Alps and the Pyrenees. The greatest circumspection was therefore displayed by the English representative at Aix-la-Chapelle, lest the alliance of 1815 should be utilized in the interests of repression. By a secret protocol dated November 15, 1818, the quadruple allies agreed to renew their engagements of 1815 as regards France and to confer on the most effectual means of arresting the fatal effects of a new revolutionary convulsion with which France may be threatened. They even provided for the disposition of the Allied forces in such an event. But there was to be no general European League which could justify regular interference in the internal concerns of independent states. On this point, the English cabinet was emphatic. Lord Liverpool had a wholesome fear of Parliament before his eyes. We must recollect, as he wrote to Castlereagh, in the whole of this business, and ought to make our allies feel, that the general and European discussion of these questions will be in the British Parliament. Castlereagh, on his side, pathetically complained that the Tsar Alexander, having only passed one day in a Polish Parliament, has no very clear notions of what can be hazarded in a British House of Commons. In the result, however, the alliance of 1815 was renewed in much more general terms. The Allied sovereigns expressed their invariable resolution never to depart either among themselves or in their relations with other states from the strictest observation of the principles of the right of nations. In a protocol of the same date, November 15, 1818, it was specifically laid down that there should be no stated or periodical meetings, but that if necessary a meeting should be arranged ad hoc, with the further important proviso that in the case of meetings called to consider the affairs of any of the minor states, they shall only take place in pursuance of a formal invitation on the part of such of those states as the said affairs may concern, and under the express reservation of their right of direct participation therein. The weight of England, wrote Lord Stuart to Lord Liverpool, has been prodigious at this meeting. In this attempt to safeguard the smaller states from the officious benevolence of the Holy Alliance, it is not difficult to trace the hand of the British representative. Indeed, Castlereagh, 
and to Castlereagh alone, Europe owed the manifest failure of the Congress of X to provide the transparent soul of the Holy Alliance with a body. The attitude maintained by Castlereagh during the remainder of his life was entirely consistent with that which he assumed during the momentous negotiations of Aix la Chapelle. When, for example, in 1819, Metternich showed his intention to employ the machinery of the German Bund for the purpose of suppressing liberty of thought and speech in the several states of the German Confederation, Castlereagh entered an emphatic protest. The Karlsbad decrees issued by the Germanic Diet at the bidding of Metternich in 1819 appeared to him to be a distinct infringement of the rights of sovereign states and as such to be repudiated by the Allied powers. Precisely the same principles inspired his policy in regard to the insurrectionary movement which in 1820 and 1821 broke out in Spain, Portugal, and Naples, and which, but for his firmness, would probably have involved a general European conflict. In no country in Europe had the shock of reaction after 1815 been felt so violently as in Spain. Ferdinand the Seventh, of all the Spanish Bourbons the most contemptible, had been welcomed back to the throne with limitless enthusiasm. But not even Spanish loyalty was proof against the combination of weakness and cruelty which he displayed. By 1820 his popularity was exhausted. The flag of insurrection was unfurled at Cadiz, and from an orgy of reaction the Spaniards characteristically plunged into an orgy of revolution. From Spain, the revolutionary infection spread to Portugal and Naples. Alexander of Russia was burning to throw a Russian army into the peninsula. Metternich was determined to restore order in southern Italy. Both hoped to obtain for their several enterprises the sanction of the Allied powers. In regard to Naples, Austria had by treaty a certain right of interference. In regard to Spain, Alexander had no rights save such as could be deduced from the principles accepted at Aix-la-Chapelle. Castlereagh was determined that the latter should not be perverted to that end. As regards Russian intervention in Spain, he was successful but against his wishes a conference to consider the whole situation met at Tropau, October 20th, 1820. At Tropau, Lord Stuart held a watching brief for Great Britain, but in the deliberations of the Congress the latter took no formal part. The policy of Great Britain, as defined by Lord Castlereagh, was from first to last unequivocal and consistent. If Austrian interests were threatened by events in Italy, Austria might intervene to protect them, provided that she engages in this undertaking with no views of aggrandizement, and that her plans are limited to objects of self-defense. But to anything in the nature of concerted action on the part of the Pentarchy, Castlereagh was unalterably opposed. Not that he was in any sense a friend to revolution— his primary, if not his sole consideration, was the maintenance of the peace of Europe, and that peace was, in his judgment, less likely to be jeopardized by domestic revolution than by the armed intervention of the great powers. The Tsar, however, was falling more and more completely under the influence of Metternich, and on November 19, 1820, the three eastern powers promulgated the Protocol of Tropau. This famous document set forth with startling explicitness the doctrines of the Holy Alliance. States, it declared, which have undergone a change of government due to revolution, the result of which threatens other states, ipso facto cease to be members of the European Alliance and remain excluded from it until their situation gives guarantees for legal order and stability. If, owing to such alterations, immediate danger threatens other states, 
the powers bind themselves by peaceful means or if need be by arms to bring back the guilty state into the bosom of the great alliance conscious perhaps of the alarm the declaration would be likely to excite and certainly aware of castlereagh's suspicious attitude the eastern sovereigns issued an explanatory circular december eighth eighteen twenty they asserted that the powers have exercised an undeniable right in concerting together upon means of safety against those states in which the overthrow of a government caused by revolution could only be considered as a dangerous example which could only result in a hostile attitude against constitutional and legitimate governments and expressed a confident hope that the goodwill of all right-minded men will no doubt follow the allied courts in the noble arena in which they are about to enter france expressed a general assent but castlereagh on behalf of great britain declined to become a party to the measures which would be in direct repugnance to the fundamental laws of this country further in a circular dispatch of great vigour january nineteenth eighteen twenty one while admitting the individual right of austria to interfere in naples he denounced the principles enunciated at tropau on the ground that they would inevitably sanction a much more extensive interference in the internal transactions of states than can be reconcilable either with the general interest or with the efficient authority and dignity of independent sovereigns castlereagh's dispatch created a profound sensation in the continental chancelleries but despite his protest a mandate was given to austria to crush the neapolitan revolt an army of eighty thousand men marched practically without resistance upon naples the wretched king ferdinand was restored vengeance was exacted from all who had taken part in the recent disturbances and the principles of legitimacy were triumphantly vindicated while austria found congenial occupation in italy france was itching to go to the assistance of bourbon absolutism in spain on the pretext of establishing a cordon sanitaire against an epidemic of yellow fever august eighteen twenty one france gradually amassed one hundred thousand men on the pyrenean frontier the eastern courts were by no means opposed to french intervention but before it could be formally sanctioned an even more threatening cloud had appeared on the diplomatic horizon in march eighteen twenty one europe was startled by the news that the greeks under prince alexander ypsilanti had raised the standard of revolt in moldavia owing to the discouraging attitude of the czar the moldavian rising proved to be a mere flash in the pan but in moria and the aegean islands the greek revolt quickly attained the dimensions of a national insurrection the greeks made no secret of their ambition the ottoman turk was to be driven out of europe and the byzantine empire to be restored at constantinople on both sides the struggle was conducted with the utmost ferocity outrages on the one side called forth cruel reprisals on the other and it became increasingly difficult for the powers in general and for russia in particular to stand aloof the czar's position was one of peculiar embarrassment as founder of the holy alliance as partner of prince metternich in the tropau protocol he was the sworn foe of revolution as the protector of the greek church and the traditional friend of turkey's enemies he was impelled to interference on behalf of the greeks moreover russia had at the moment her own quarrel with the turk there was the utmost danger that the two quarrels in their origin distinct would merge into one and that russia would use the greek insurrection to further her own traditional ambitions such an issue would have been in castlereagh's judgment entirely repugnant to british interests and on july sixteenth eighteen twenty one castlereagh now lord londonderry availing himself for the first time of a unique privilege 
addressed directly to the Tsar, a letter which adroitly turned against the Tsar his own principles and laid down with admirable explicitness the line which British policy was thenceforth to follow. His supreme object was to stop the isolated intervention of the Tsar. In this, he was entirely successful. But the atmosphere continued to be explosive, the peace of Europe hung by a very slender thread. How long could Russia be restrained from crossing the Pruth and France from crossing the Pyrenees? How long could England refrain from recognizing the belligerent rights, if not the independence, of the Spanish colonies in South America? These were the questions which once more brought the powers into conference at Vienna and Verona in the autumn of 1822. At that conference, England was to be represented by the foreign minister himself, but until he could arrive, her interests were to be confided to the Duke of Wellington. Castlereagh, therefore, fortunately for his own reputation, drafted an elaborate memorandum which conclusively attests his own sagacity and foreshadows the policy adopted in its entirety by Canning. In the discussion on the Italian question, England was to take no part, lest by doing so she should appear to admit the justice of a proceeding against which from the outset she had protested. In regard to the Eastern question, every effort was to be made to reconcile the differences between Russia and Turkey, and then, and not until then, the condition of Greece might be considered. The recognition of the Greeks as a de facto government had become almost inevitable, but the British plenipotentiary was to stand aloof from any engagement with the Allies either to accept the Greek government as that of an independent state or to compel the submission of Greece herself to the port by force of arms. As regards the domestic revolution in Spain, that is a matter with which, in the opinion of the English cabinet, no foreign power has the smallest right to interfere. The case of the revolted Spanish colonies was different. Over by far the greater part of them Spain has lost all hold, and it is clear that their recognition as independent states has become merely a question of time. England, therefore, was to advocate the principle that while no help should be given to revolting colonies, every province which had actually established its independence should be recognized. But this must be a matter between Spain and England exclusively. There is to be no concert with France or Russia or any other extraneous power to effect it. Other nations may or may not come into the views which England entertains, but upon their approval or disapproval of her views, England is not in any way to shape her conduct. Finally, England is to urge the final suppression of the slave trade. The memorandum is a masterly exposition of the principles which from first to last inspired Castlereagh's policy. A strenuous insistence upon national independence, abstention from interference in the domestic concerns of independent states, and a frank recognition of the claims of new nationalities which had de facto established their independence. Adopted by Canning, these principles were asserted by him with a vigor in action to which his predecessor could not pretend. Castlereagh's course was run. Worn out by the twofold strain of parliamentary leadership and diplomatic responsibility, his mind gave way, and on August 12, 1822, he died by his own hand. He had reached the climax of his career in 1815. Always devoid of personal magnetism, the last seven years of his life had filled to the brim the cup of his unpopularity. The brutal shouts of his enemies even desecrated the closing scene in Westminster Abbey. Broom, indeed, was big enough to appreciate a fallen foe. Put all their men together in one scale and poor Castlereagh in the other. Single, he plainly weighed them down. 
Creevy expressed, though with characteristic malevolence, the prevailing view among his opponents. A worse, or if he had had talent and ambition for it, a more dangerous public man never existed. No English statesman has ever incurred greater or more undeserved unpopularity. His diplomacy was misunderstood, and it was his misfortune to be compelled in addition to bear the odium of the domestic policy of the government. The financial blunders of Van Sittert, the repressive legislation of Sidmouth and Eldon, the unsavory business of Queen Caroline, for all these things Castlereagh was of course in part responsible, and in exceptional degree was made to suffer. And impartial history has only begun to do tardy justice to his qualities. Apart from the official biography of Allison, the memory of Castlereagh was left for half a century to the mercy of his opponents. But a reaction is clearly discernible. One of the greatest of our foreign ministers, warmly testifying to his courage, patience, and faultless sagacity, has declared him to be that rare phenomenon, a practical man of the highest order, who yet did not by that fact forfeit his title to be considered a man of genius. Footnote. Lord Salisbury, Biographical Essays, Volume 149. The writer adds shrewdly and characteristically, quote, He might have maintained his policy with impunity if he would have done readier homage to the liberal catchwords of the day, if he had only constructed a few brilliant periods about nationality or freedom, or given a little wordy sympathy to Greece or Naples or Spain, or the South American republics, the world would have heard much less of the horrors of his policy. End quote. End footnote. The dual position which Castlereagh had held was pressed by Lord Liverpool upon the acceptance of Canning, and thus at the age of fifty-two, Canning became for the second time foreign secretary and for the first time leader of the House of Commons. Born in 1770 and educated at Eton and Christchurch, Canning's political career had hitherto been singularly checkered. Entering the House of Commons as a disciple of Pitt in 1793, he was appointed in 1796 to serve his official apprenticeship under Grenville as Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs. He became an Indian Commissioner in 1799, Joint Paymaster of the Forces in 1800, and in 1801 resigned office with Pitt. For the next three years he found the serious business of life in incessant intrigue against Pitt's successor and his recreation in the manufacture of squibs to be fired off against the doctor. The squibs did Addington little harm and Canning no good. On Pitt's return to power in 1804, Canning became treasurer of the Navy and was thus fortunate enough to be at the Admiralty during the critical year of the naval campaign against Napoleon. He resigned on Pitt's death in 1806 and was not included in Grenville's ministry, though its popular appellation, All the Talents, could not, as Fox handsomely observed, be strictly applied to any government from which Canning was excluded. In the following year, Canning joined the Portland Ministry as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Castlereagh became at the same time Secretary for the Colonies and War, an office which afforded ample opportunities for friction with the Foreign Minister. On neither side were they neglected. Canning's first tenure of the Foreign Office, 1807 to 1809, was memorable for the success with which he foiled the conspiracy of Tilsit, for the unfortunate but unavoidable bombardment of Copenhagen, and for the opening scenes of the Peninsula Campaign. Into the causes which led to the unfortunate duel between Canning and Castlereagh, and to the break-up of the ministry of which they were the main supports, it is unnecessary to enter. It is sufficient to recall the fact that while Castlereagh returned to office as Foreign Secretary in 1812, and retained that office continuously for ten years, Canning never regained a foremost place in English politics during his great rival's life. Castlereagh, indeed, with great magnanimity, 
offered to resign the foreign office in his favour on the formation of the liverpool administration in eighteen twelve canning described the offer without hyperbole as the handsomest ever made to an individual but he declined to accept it without the leadership in the commons and for four years he was out of office in eighteen sixteen he re-entered the cabinet as president of the board of control but his friendship with Queen Caroline rendered it difficult for him to remain a member of the cabinet while her business was under discussion, and accordingly in 1820 he resigned. All his colleagues and even the king parted with him, it would seem, with genuine regret, and the cordial letter addressed to him by Castlereagh proves that the old bitterness between these great men was largely assuaged liverpool repeatedly pressed canning's claims to readmission upon the king but the latter was obdurate and canning's career in english politics seemed to be definitely closed before it was well begun it was under these circumstances that in the summer of eighteen twenty two he accepted the governor-generalship of india and was in the midst of preparations for departure when the death of Lord Londonderry opened once more the prospect of high office at home. The idea of India had, however, by this time laid its spell upon Canning, and it was apparently with real regret that he received the offer of the whole inheritance. Anything less he had resolved to refuse. To the last day I hoped, he wrote to Charles Bagot, that the proposal made to me might be one which I could refuse it was not, and in 1822 Canning obtained his lifelong ambition. End of Section 5section 6 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3 The Holy Alliance Castlereagh and Canning, England and Europe, 1815 to 1830, Part 2. On his return to the Foreign Office, Canning was confronted by three questions of immense difficulty the Greek insurrection and the quarrel between Russia and Turkey the internal affairs of old spain and the relations between spain and her revolted colonies in south america to these was subsequently added a fourth the position of the house of braganza in portugal and brazil in regard to the first three he adopted without modification the instructions drawn up by castlereagh wellington who represented great britain at the congress of verona told the powers that while there was no sympathy and would be none between england and revolutionists and jacobins england must insist on the right of nations to set up over themselves whatever form of government they thought best above all there must be no concerted intervention on behalf of absolutism in spain the protest of wellington averted joint action it could not stop the intervention of france and despite all the efforts of canning the duke d'angouleme crossed the bidashoa at the head of one hundred thousand men april sixth eighteen twenty three within a few months ferdinand the seventh of spain was restored to his throne and his authority and under the protection of french troops who remained encamped in spain until eighteen twenty seven he was able to wreak a terrible vengeance upon his enemies. Foiled in old Spain, Canning turned to the new and sought materials of compensation in another hemisphere. He was resolved that if France had Spain, it should not be Spain with the Indies, and he called the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. The situation in South America had indeed become intolerable. For outrages unnumbered upon British ships and traders, no redress could be obtained from the Spanish government. Spain indeed was impotent to control the action of her colonies. 
with those colonies therefore canning determined to deal directly to punish the privateers and to recognize the independence of those countries which appear to have established their separation from spain before the end of eighteen twenty three councils were appointed to protect british interests in most of the principal towns in eighteen twenty four great britain recognized the independence of buenos aires colombia and mexico and in eighteen twenty five of bolivia chile and peru spain was powerless to resist canning's will but france was not in eighteen twenty three it was rumoured that france meant to extend her intervention from the old spain to the new france was bluntly informed that no such intervention would be permitted by great britain october eighteen twenty three and the latter's attitude was supported by the united states on december second eighteen twenty three president monroe sent to congress the famous message in which he declared that any interference on the part of the great powers of europe for the purpose of oppressing or controlling the destiny of the spanish american states which had declared their independence would be dangerous to the peace and safety of the united states and would be considered as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward them by eighteen twenty five the spanish empire in south america was all but wiped out the language and still more the action of canning sealed the doom of the holy alliance and ended the attempt to govern europe by congresses england had got little satisfaction from congresses we protested at laibach we remonstrated at verona our protest was treated as waste paper our remonstrances mingled with the air our influence if it is to be maintained abroad must be secure in the sources of strength at home and the sources of that strength are in the sympathy between the people and the government canning's language was apt to be a trifle magniloquent but magniloquence was not with him a substitute for action this was proved conclusively in his dealings with portugal in all the complicated web of modern european history there is no more tangled skein than that provided by portugal and brazil the line taken by canning is however tolerably clear and with that alone fortunately we are concerned in eighteen o seven just after canning had foiled the tilsit conspiracy napoleon had issued an edict that the house of braganza had ceased to reign the royal family and court made their escape in time and transferred the seat of government to brazil at the restoration of eighteen fifteen it was naturally expected that john the sixth would return to lisbon but he preferred rio janeiro and portugal was in effect reduced to the position of a dependency of its own colony in eighteen twenty the revolutionary contagion spread from spain to portugal and john in eighteen twenty one was reluctantly compelled to return to europe to reassert his authority in the following year eighteen twenty two the brazilians threw off the yoke of the mother country and proclaimed dom pedro eldest son of john the sixth as constitutional emperor of brazil meanwhile the successful intervention of france in the absolutist interest in spain excited the hopes of the portuguese reactionaries who were led by the king's second son and heir don miguel france was only too eager to extend her intervention from spain to portugal and was restrained solely by the firm attitude of canning the constitutionalists in portugal applied for the assistance of english troops this request canning was compelled conformably with his principles of non-intervention to refuse but he sent a british squadron to the tagus and made it otherwise clear to france and to europe that if england refrained from interference on behalf of the one party france must refrain on behalf of the other the ships moreover were found useful when in april eighteen twenty four dom miguel effected a coup d'etat and virtually superseded his father 
john the sixth went on board the windsor castle and from that vantage point effectually reasserted his authority don miguel was exiled order was restored the gallophils were deposed and canning triumphed in eighteen twenty five canning had the further satisfaction of bringing about a settlement of the long-standing differences between portugal and brazil as a result of a conference in london a treaty was signed august twenty ninth eighteen twenty five by which john the sixth recognized the independence of brazil and his best beloved son dom pedro as emperor six months later john the sixth died march tenth eighteen twenty six the emperor pedro thereupon promulgated a constitutional charter for portugal but renounced his rights on the throne in favour of his daughter the infanta maria a child of seven who was to marry her uncle miguel but the miguelists refused the compromise and appealed for help to spain the party of the regency appealed to england to canning intervention was one thing intervention to repel intervention was another he waited only for the assurance that spain meant to support the miguelists by arms this reached him on december eighth and four days later he announced to parliament that an english force was on its way to portugal not an hour had been lost the precise information on which alone we could act arrived only on friday last on saturday the decision of the government was taken on sunday we obtained the sanction of his majesty on monday we came down to parliament and at this very hour while i have the honour of addressing this house british troops are on their way to portugal in one of his most effective speeches canning announced to parliament and to europe the principle on which the government had acted england had no wish to interfere on either side in portugal but neither would she permit any one else to do so the holy allies were scandalized but spain desisted from any further efforts to assist the portuguese reactionaries canning's prompt and decisive action not only saved the liberal constitution in portugal but probably averted a european war the english force remained in portugal until april eighteen twenty eight canning was now dead dom miguel had been appointed by his brother to the regency in february of eighteen twenty eight and despite his oath of fealty to the constitution made no secret of his intention to exchange the regency for the crown wellington who became prime minister in january of eighteen twenty eight had always disliked canning's foreign policy refused to let english troops take side in domestic broils in portugal and insisted on their withdrawal no longer restrained by their presence miguel flung aside all dissimulation all the ministers at lisbon except those of rome and spain withdrew and portugal plunged into an orgy of reaction meanwhile the infanta maria dispatched from brazil by her father in ignorance of the doings of don miguel was brought to england where she was received as queen of portugal on september eighteen twenty eight in england she was joined by the leading portuguese constitutionalists and by some three thousand to four thousand military refugees wellington anxious to maintain the strictest neutrality was now in a position of great embarrassment he had only too good reason to fear that england would be used as the base of the operations against the de facto government of portugal despite all his vigilance an expedition did sail from england in january of eighteen twenty nine for the azores but it was intercepted by an english squadron and effected nothing not until eighteen thirty four was the matter finally settled when miguel was compelled by the joint action of the western powers to sign the convention of evora by which he renounced his rights to the throne of portugal and left the way clear for his niece dona maria of much greater importance than the affairs of spain or portugal though of less immediate interest to the diplomatists at verona was the development of events in eastern europe 
here also canning adopted and maintained the policy defined by castlereagh both statesmen were friendly to the greek cause but both regarded the question primarily and properly from the point of view of british interests and both used every endeavour to induce turkey to agree with her greek adversary quickly lest russia should get the opportunity of fishing in troubled waters for three years from eighteen twenty one to eighteen twenty four the greeks despite fierce internal feuds more than held their own against the turks but in eighteen twenty four the sultan summoned to his aid ibrahim pasha the son of his vassal mehmet ali of egypt ibrahim occupied crete in eighteen twenty four and in the following year crossed to the morea where he harried slaughtered and devastated in all directions the rumour ran that he meant to carry off all the greeks who were spared by his ferocious troops into bondage in egypt from the first the greek cause had been warmly espoused by the english people partly from classical sentiment and partly from religious partly from detestation of the turk and not least in response to the eloquence of byron volunteers had gone in their thousands not from england only but from other western nations and from the united states tidings of ibrahim's deeds and intentions roused the phil hellenist sentiment to the highest pitch meanwhile in england itself the cause of the insurgents seemed desperate misolonghi fell in eighteen twenty six after a year's heroic defence to which english volunteers materially contributed and in the following year, despite the efforts of Lord Cochrane, General Church, and others, Athens itself was compelled to surrender. How was the progress of events in southeastern Europe regarded by the powers and peoples of the West? Metternich never diverged for an instant from the line he had from the first taken up. The Greeks were lawless rebels and must be left to their fate. Prussia, as usual, followed humbly in the wake of Austria in france however the philhellenist sentiment was not powerless and in england and russia it might at any moment get beyond the control of the respective governments in march of eighteen twenty three canning had been obliged by the same logic of events as necessitated the recognition of the south american republics to recognize the greeks as belligerents as in the west so in the east the insurgents took to piracy British trade was suffering severely. No redress could be obtained from the nominal sovereign, and none could be asked at the hands of a non-recognized belligerent. The recognition of the belligerent character of the Greeks, as Canning explained, was necessitated by the impossibility of treating as pirates a population of a million souls, and of bringing within the bounds of civilized war a contest which had been marked at the outset on both sides by disgusting barbarity. Russia resented Canning's isolated action, and in January of 1824 proposed collective intervention. Anxious to avoid encouragement to Greek nationality, she suggested that Greece, including the archipelago, should be divided into three autonomous provinces on the model of Moldavia and Wallachia, nominally subject to turkish suzerainty but practically under russian protection to settle the details a conference was invited to meet at st petersburg the port was furious when it learned the proposal and in august eighteen twenty five the greeks themselves addressed canning in an equally angry protest the plan they complained was one for giving them over bound hand and foot to the turks and they declared that they would perish to the last man rather than submit to be negotiated about on such principles hereupon wrote canning we say halt sir charles bagot was accordingly withdrawn from the conference at st petersburg but nevertheless canning assented to a mildly worded offer of mediation which was presented in a joint note to the combatants in march of eighteen twenty five the port 
flushed with Ibrahim's victories, contemptuously refused the offer. The Greeks, in desperation, turned once more to Canning, placed themselves formally under British protection, and begged that Great Britain would send them a king. The suggestion was, of course, inadmissible, and Canning made it clear to the Greeks that he could not depart from his policy of strict though benevolent neutrality. At this juncture the situation was profoundly affected by the sudden death on December 1, 1825, of the Tsar Alexander. His successor, Nicholas, was a man of different mold and temper. He had none of Alexander's western veneer, nor of his mysticism and sentiment. He was a Russian to the core. Alexander had clearly discerned the revolutionary march in the troubles of the Peloponnese. Nicholas cared even less for the Greeks than his predecessor, but he was even more indisposed to allow the port to play fast and loose with Russia. Canning was becoming convinced as to the necessity of a frank understanding with that court, the more so since Prince Liefen, the Russian ambassador in London, had expressed the wish that Canning would take the question into his own hands, since Great Britain was the only power which could bring the state of affairs in Greece to a satisfactory settlement. To this end, Canning induced the Duke of Wellington to undertake a special mission to St. Petersburg to congratulate the new Tsar on his accession, January 1826. The Duke was further charged to adjust, if possible, the outstanding difficulties between Russia and Turkey, and to arrive at an understanding with Russia on the Greek question. The result of the mission was seen in the signature, on April 4, 1826, of the Protocol of St. Petersburg. By this treaty, the two powers, renouncing any augmentation of territory, any exclusive influence, or any preferential commercial advantages for themselves, agreed to offer their mediation to the port. Greece, though continuing to pay tribute to the port, was to become a virtually independent state, to be governed by authorities chosen by itself, and to enjoy entire liberty of conscience and commerce. To prevent collisions in the future, the Turks were to evacuate Greece, and the Greeks were to purchase the property of the Turks on the Grecian continent or islands. This protocol must be regarded as a political triumph for Canning and a personal triumph for Wellington, but it did nothing to adjust the outstanding differences between Russia and Turkey. In regard to these, the new Tsar was determined to brook neither dallying on the part of the port nor intervention on the part of the powers. He had already embodied his terms in an ultimatum dispatched to Constantinople, March 17th, 1826, and the port, temporarily embarrassed by the mutiny of the Janissaries, was compelled to accept them in the Convention of Ackerman, October 7, 1826. As regards Greece, on the other hand, the port, in the full tide of triumphant barbarity, showed no signs of accepting any mediation unless backed by force. Greece had already formally applied for it, Accordingly, in September 1826, Canning proposed to the Tsar common action to enforce mediation upon the Sultan. If the Sultan remained obdurate, the two powers agreed to intimate to him that they would look to Greece with an eye of favor and with a disposition to seize the first occasion for recognizing as an independent state such portion of her territory as should have freed itself from Turkish dominion. Every effort was made to bring the other powers into line. Metternich, however, left no stone unturned to frustrate Canning's policy, even to the extent of using Baxter's influence to create mistrust between the court and the cabinet. Prussia followed Metternich's lead, but France concluded with Russia and Great Britain the Treaty of London, July 1827. The public articles of the treaty were substantially identical with the terms of the protocol, in accordance with which an immediate armistice was to be offered to the belligerents. 
a secret article provided that the port should be plainly informed that the powers intend to take immediate measures for an approximation with the greeks and that if within a month the port do not accept the armistice or if the greeks refuse to execute it the high contracting powers should intimate to one or both parties that they intend to exert all the means which circumstances may suggest to their prudence to obtain the immediate effect of the armistice by preventing all collision between the contending parties without however taking any part in the hostilities between them a joint note was presented to the turk august sixteenth who indignantly declined mediation but by this time the control of events was passing from the hands of dallying diplomatists into those of prompt sailors the admirals in command of the british and french fleets in the levant were informed of the terms of the treaty on august seventh sir edward codrington found them difficult of interpretation was he to use force or not he appealed to the british ambassador at constantinople and satisfied with stratford canning's answer he sailed for the morea a large egyptian fleet had meanwhile sailed with reinforcements for the morea and on september seventh joined the turkish ships in navarino bay the allied fleets of england france and russia followed ibrahim was informed that none of his ships would be allowed to leave the harbour and quickly discovered that the allied admirals meant to enforce their orders foiled at sea he renewed his attack on land with increased ferocity of the atrocities he committed the sailors were all but eye-witnesses to remain passive was impossible but agreeably to instructions there were to be no hostilities the turks however opened fire the battle became general and before sundown on october twentieth the turco-egyptian fleet had disappeared the bay of navarino was covered with their wrecks the news of the battle of navarino was received with amazement throughout europe and by the english government with something like consternation the sailors had indeed cut the gordian knot tied by the diplomatists but they got no thanks in england for doing it canning was dead august eighth and wellington who after five months interval succeeded to his place made no secret of his dislike of canning's policy the turk with consummate impudence described navarino as a revolting outrage and demanded compensation and apologies even wellington was not prepared to go this length but the king was made january twenty ninth eighteen twenty eight to lament deeply that this conflict should have occurred with the naval forces of an ancient ally and to express a confident hope that this untoward event will not be followed by further hostilities the one anxiety of the new government was to preserve the independence and integrity of the ottoman empire no language could have been more nicely calculated to defeat this object turkey was of course encouraged to persist in her attitude toward greece and to renew her quarrel with russia russia was permitted and even compelled to engage single-handed in war with the turks thus all the fruits of years of diplomacy on canning's part were carelessly dissipated in a few months by his successors the port meanwhile denounced the convention of ackermann and declared a holy war against the infidel on december twentieth eighteen twenty seven russia though with ample professions to the powers of complete disinterestedness accepted the challenge and in may eighteen twenty eight one hundred and fifty thousand russian troops under wittgenstein crossed the prut the turks to the amazement of europe made not only a stubborn but an effective resistance but in july eighteen twenty nine diebitsch by a masterly march crossed the balkans and appeared before adrianople august nineteenth constantinople was at his mercy 
Kars and Ezerum had already fallen, and the Sultan had no alternative but to accept the terms embodied in the Treaty of Adrianople. In the long history of the Eastern question, the Treaty of Adrianople is inferior only in importance to those of Canargi and Berlin. Russia restored her conquests, except the great islands of the Danube, but her title to Georgia and the other provinces of the Caucasus was acknowledged. All neutral vessels were to have free navigation in the Black Sea and on the Danube. Practical autonomy was granted to the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia under Russian protection. Russian traders in Turkey were to be under the exclusive jurisdiction of their own consuls, while in regard to Greece, the port accepted the Treaty of London, thus virtually acknowledging its independence. The final settlement of the Greek question was referred to a conference which was to meet in London. It provided plenty of occupation to the diplomatists for some time to come, and not until 1831 was Lord Palmerston at last able to bring matters to a tolerably satisfactory issue. Greece was to be independent under the guarantee of Great Britain, France, and Russia. The frontier was, after much wrangling, fixed with some niggardliness at a line extending from the Gulf of Volo on the east to Arta on the west. The form of government was to be a constitutional monarchy, and the crown, having been declined first by Prince John of Saxony, and then, after a momentary acceptance by Prince Leopold of saxe coburg was ultimately accepted by Otto, second son of King Louis of Bavaria. Count Campodistrius, who had been virtually ruler of Greece, was assassinated in 1831, and the way was clear, therefore, for the new king, who began his ill-starred reign in 1833. The treaties of Adrianople and London close a chapter in the history of English foreign policy, and more particularly in that section of it which is concerned with the unravelling of that shifting, intractable, and interwoven tangle of conflicting interests, rival peoples, and antagonistic faiths that is veiled under the easy name of the Eastern Question. Footnote. The phrase is Lord Morley's. End footnote. The Duke of Wellington supposed that he had seen the beginning of the end of it. The Treaty of Adrianople, he declared to be, the death blow to the independence of the Ottoman port and the forerunner of the dissolution and extinction of its power. After the lapse of eighty years, few would be found to re-echo this confident prediction. The Duke, like the Tsar Nicholas, unquestionably underrated the marvellous recuperative power of the sick man and the adroitness with which he learnt to turn to account the jealousies of the powers. Those jealousies still retard the solution of a problem to which the Hellenic rising added one more factor and still mock the efforts of those who would fain give substance to the dreams though they repudiate the methods of the Holy Alliance. End of section six.